Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, the chair lady of this evening's proceedings, Senator Diane Chedi Baldio Singh. Baldio Singh Chedi, ABC, yes. Confusing names like that. Thank you very much, Senator. Party Chairman, Mr. Franklin Khan. Deputy Political Leader, Party and Elections, Mrs. Joan Yule Williams. Deputy Political Leader, Policy, Mr. Rohan Sinanan. My parliamentary colleague, Member of Parliament for Diego Martin Northeast, Mr. Colin Imbert. My parliamentary colleague, all the way from Point Fortin, Member of Parliament for Point Fortin, Mrs. Paula Gopi Schoon. The next Member of Parliament for Tuna Puna, Mr. Esmond Ford. Party officers present in the crowd tonight. My other parliamentary colleagues, PNM's candidates, I see quite a few of them here tonight, but I want to recognize one PNM stalwart, especially tonight, former member of parliament for Ruka North, Mr. Jarrett Marine. And if ever there was a PNM with a voice that you could never forget, to Jared Narayan. Welcome to our PNM meeting tonight. And I do see one or two faces from Diego Martin West. Thank you for coming out to this meeting tonight. But ladies and gentlemen, before I get into the public business of this evening's proceedings, I want to take this opportunity to thank all the people of Trinidad and Tobago who have stood with me and my family in the last week. I want to let you know that I have absolutely no regrets having left my professional career in the University of the West Indies, where I was head of department, having come through from a student stage to a senior lecturer stage, head of department, I have absolutely no regrets that I did enter into the political arena. Because I believe that I have been able to make some kind of contribution to the development of Trinidad and Tobago in the last decade. And I do this without any expectation because this country has already been good to me and my family. During the last week, I have had to endure the worst that the political arena could produce. And whatever pain I felt is not for me, because I could deal with every one of them rats every night, every day. But you see, where I grew up and when I grew up in Mason Hall, there were some things that men didn't do. And one was to show emotion. Because no real man did that when I grew up in Mason Hall. So I never told my grandfather how much I loved him. But God knows I love Joe Rowley. I never told my father, Carlton Joseph, how much I loved him. But God knows, 
I love that man. And 36 years after he died, to be labeled a rapist in the parliament of Trinidad and Tobago is difficult for us to take. And by us, I mean all my brothers, all five of them, their children, their wives, their grandchildren, and even the unborn. So tonight, I want to thank Trinidad and Tobago. All those who have expressed in any way your absolute rejection of this indecency. Because this can only happen when you fall in love with office. And I keep telling my colleagues, the new ones and the old ones, for heaven's sake, having entered public office, do not fall in love with office. It will drive you to madness and destruction. So today, you would have heard Mr. Imbert's theme song. You know he used to be a weightlifter. Now he's a rock star. But we all sing the tune. If you have anything to say about my private life, my family life, my personal life, my public life, if you could say it inside, come outside. And guess what? Some of them have come outside. So today, I have instructed my lawyers to file suit against 91.1 and Wendell Eversley. I have instructed my lawyers to file suit against Morgan Job and 102. I have instructed my lawyers to file suit against Gladiator and 91.9. And my lawyers, in the next few days, will be examining the publications and writings of Philip Alexander, and they already have instructions that if they find that I have been slandered, to sue Philip Alexander. And the reason why I'm doing this is not because I'm vengeful. It is because I want to protect the climate of the political arena in Trinidad and Tobago. All those who feel that if you can't contend with a man, then you dig up his dead father and his dead mother and make politics of it. If you have something to say, come and say it in an air-conditioned room in the Hall of Justice. And if you know I've done something wrong, I've demonstrated not once, not twice, but repeatedly that because I am in public life, I have to account. Call the Commission of Inquiry, I appear. You have no Commission of Inquiry, I ask for one. And if you sue me, I appear in court. So I've also instructed my lawyers that as fast as they come, as long as they breach the law and slander or libel me, sue them and sue them again. I will do my discussions on my private life and my family life, not in the parliament of Trinidad and Tobago. I'll do it in the courthouse of Trinidad and Tobago. And on all this occasion, I don't do it for me in 2015. I do it for Carlton Joseph in the Delphi Church Cemetery and for Vasi Rowley in the Tunapuna Cemetery. But you see, if that could happen to the leader of the opposition, who in their right mind would want to leave the comfort of their boardroom or wherever else to enter the political arena in Trinidad and Tobago. What these people are saying, and I'm not here now talking about vanilla, I am talking about the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago and the Cabinet of Trinidad and Tobago and the UNC. And tonight, 
I want to instruct all PNM spokespersons. I don't want to hear about no partnership on the PNM platform. There is no partnership. There is a UNC government and a train that they're dragging. There's no partnership in Trinidad and Tobago. What you have is a criminal empire. A criminal empire. And if they could so conspire to once again use the parliament as part of their election campaign and to go down in the way they've gone down in the last week, who in their right mind would want to enter the political arena to face that? To face lies like that? I mean, it's bad enough if, if, if it were true and they expose it. But to fabricate lies like that? And even after the truth has come forward, they're still carrying on with it? You know what's going to happen to this country if we don't deal decisively with this? Decent people will stay away from public life in Trinidad and Tobago. And once decent people stay away, who will run the country? The crooks. The crooks will take charge of us going forward. So when we got independence in 1962, and Dr. Williams and Patrick Solomon and Kamaluddin Muhammad and others thought we were building a future for our children and grandchildren, this government led by Kamala Prasad Bisesa is saying to you, if you dare come into the public life and interfere with me and my cabal, this is your portion. And then the public enterprises, the cabinet, and the whole public system will be run by crooks. We are already very close to that. Today, half of the cabinet talking to the police and the other half waiting to talk to the police. And they would have you believe that the issue in this election is how many children Keith Rowley had before he was married. I don't want to know how much they had before they were married, after they were married, and when they did. Understand? I'm not interested in their public life. If we had a national inquirer in Trinidad and Tobago, it could not have enough pages to describe their public life and their private life. We're not interested. What we are interested in on the public platform is that we do not allow these ridiculous developments to distract you, the people, from your business. You will make a fundamental mistake indeed if you allow your time that you look towards public affairs to be spent on these nonsense. Because you will not pay attention to the real issues that should be the election campaign. And the real issue is this. You elected a prime minister with a huge majority in the last election. The country did. She came in with tremendous goodwill because in 2010 the PNM was down and out. And that Prime Minister came in with a lot of goodwill. I have no problem, I have no personal problem with Mrs. Kabla Prasad Bisesa, none whatsoever. As a matter of fact, she's my parliamentary colleague, and when the history of this country is written, it will be so writ that we serve together. As a matter of fact, one of the first speeches I made in the parliament was to say to Mrs. Prasad Bisesa, this country has a new government and a new opposition, and a lot of old problems, let us try and work together to see how we could solve the country's problems, doing things differently from 2010. That's on the hand side. And I didn't just talk that, I acted it. I led the PNM members of parliament to vote for the first budget that Mrs. Passard Bissasa brought. It was the only time in the history of this country that the opposition voted for the government's budget. Remember that? And one year later, or a year and a half later, when we saw exactly where they were heading, we had to bring a motion of no confidence in the Prime Minister, early o'clock. And if you go to that motion of no confidence, where I, I let that motion off and my colleagues spoke on it, we never spoke about the private life of any member of parliament. But we raised a number of issues of public administration where the Prime Minister was falling down. Because whatever she is, whoever she is, she's the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. But what, what is the problem? The problem is that the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago 
has consistently shown deplorable judgment in discharging her duties and as a result of that the people of this country has been and will continue to pay dearly and another term in office will not change that you'll get more of the same and that's why we are saying to you in the coming election you cannot afford to re-elect the UNC government and Mrs. Kamala Posad Bissessa. That is the singular issue. Nothing personal. Everything public and public interest. A prime minister who has demonstrated time and time again that she does not know what good judgment is in making decisions on behalf of Trinidad and Tobago. And tonight I could give you a whole list of examples, but that is for another time. I want tonight to speak specifically about a development that is very worrisome. A couple, not too long ago, might be a day or two ago, I was informed that the National Gas Company has gone to the court to get an ex parte injunction against the Trinidad Express. Ex parte injunction means they're going behind your back. And without you being there to say anything, they want to ask the judge to take action against you. The National Gas Company is a company formed by the PNM way back in the 70s, and it has today become the main money earner of the government of Trinidad and Tobago. Our lifeblood passes through that company. There was never a scandal in that company. It has always been run by people of high standing and professionalism and the company was always very well run. Some of you don't even know what goes on down there because no news is good news. The minute Mrs. Passat Bissessa came into office, as she did in all the other state enterprises, she very carefully, when she eventually did it, having found the person she was looking for, staffed that company's board with people of questionable ilk. And the National Gas Company began to be derailed. That company normally holds within its accounts as much as $10 billion in cash. Earning that kind of money, $3 or $4 billion a year, and the government will take dividends as we see fit and go down the road. The minute this government came into office with the BDIs, they saw that money in there. And they decided they're going to use it, they're going to waste it, they're going to thief it, or they're going to burn it. So the National Gas Company now suddenly, in 2015, found itself the subject of some of the most disturbing news in the local newspapers, where it has been shown that the auditors have been reporting on the carryings on of the hundreds of millions of dollars of your money, not Mrs. Passat Bissessa's money. Because all the way she behaves, you'll get the impression that she's giving you goodies from her pocket. It is your money, the people's money. And the people they've put in the company have been spending it willy-nilly. There are a number of instances where they will go to a playground and get a bid for $200,000 or $200,000 worth of job to do a playing ground on a fence. But inside the company, that is $2 million. And that goes on around the country in UNC constituencies, largely. About 15 of those in their own constituency. And then... In the chairman's office, they'll be awarding contracts left, right, and center to selected friends. You would have seen me in the parliament talking about three contracts in one day to some SIS sub-companies where the directors are SIS employees. One for three million, one for five million, one for nine million to go and fix up little, ground, little playgrounds around the country. That is how they shovel the money out of the treasury. But the auditors started picking up those things and reporting on them. The next thing we know is that the auditors have now been having to be worried about their lives because the story is now in the newspapers and the company removed the auditors and putting in new auditors of their choice and so on and so on. So the audit function in the company now falls under political control for political direction and now the company has the goal to go to court to get an injunction against the Express to tell the Express not to publish anything on the company. Tonight, I want to tell the Express that you owe this company, a, this, this country, a duty of care 
to ensure that the NGC does not succeed in shutting down the express role in informing the people of this country what is going on in that country. And speaking from a PNM platform, it is this PNM as the government of Trinidad and Tobago that led the putting into the constitution freedom of the press. And I'm calling on the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago tonight to tell her friends in the, U in the NGC that where the express is concerned, where the press is concerned, tell them to back off until the police reach. <laughs> Using your taxpayers' money to pay lawyers hundreds of thousands of dollars to try to shut the express up so you wouldn't know what's going on inside there. And in the meantime, while you're being denied that kind of information, and the express must know and can't print to inform you, they're bombarding you with all kinds of all kinds of nonsense about government working for you and voices. The voice you want to hear is the express telling you what is going on in the NGC, in Cal, and all the other state enterprises. Because without the PNM and the media, we would never have known because we couldn't believe that that government could be as bad as this government. Couldn't believe that they could have been so bad. We knew they were bad, but we couldn't believe they were so bad. And in this country where in the Constitution, we have entrenched in their press freedom. You have a government encouraging a state board to go for ex parte injunction to tell a newspaper you can't publish, and what documents you have, you have to give it to us. That's going on right now. But of course, they are afraid that the Express will tell you that their flagship process, the, that project, which they call the Highway to Point 40, remember that one? That was supposed to be done within budget and within time by 2014. 2014 come and gone. 2015 is upon us. The election is a few months away, a few weeks or a few days away. The project is in deep trouble. You know why? Once again, the judgment of Mrs. Passad Bissessa is being called into question. They embarked upon that project without proper financial arrangements in place. You would have heard us saying this over and over. They also embarked upon it with dubious procedures in place. And guess what? The news coming out of Brazil is that the contractor is now into bankruptcy proceedings. Bankruptcy proceedings, and guess for what? For paying bribes in Brazil. Well, if they were paying bribes in Brazil, I hope when they got to Trinidad, there were sons and daughters of Mother Teresa. Right now, I could tell you, the accounts office down there is without any local input. Only Brazilians inside there. Operating as a satellite to a bankrupt company in Brazil. And of course, the local contractors who've been working for them are now in great danger because they're not being paid. And they're hoping that this will remain silent until after election. So all of these distractions that they're generating is to keep the real issues away from you. Because that is a $7 billion project. It is the largest project ever undertaken by the government of Trinidad and Tobago. It is in trouble right now. And eventually, as night follows day, it will fall to the PNM to pick up the pieces of that They want to get past election day. So at these issues of their judgment, their mismanagement, their corruption, their incompetence, that that does not form part of the election campaign. But that is the election campaign, and the PNM will make sure that that remains the election campaign. We have to thank God for small mercies that the Prime Minister in this government is Kamala Prasad Bissessa. Because the polls are showing that she's the best of the bad lot. Can't argue with that. 
Could you imagine if Ram Logan was the Prime Minister? Or Ram Bachan? Or Mooney Lal? Or Gopi Singh? Or Errol McLeod? So we have to thank God for small mercies. Another nonsense is going on now, arising out of a judgment. It was the Prime Minister, once again, showing her poor judgment, selecting Anand Ramlugan as the Attorney General of Trinidad and Tobago. Anybody and everybody who knew Anand Ramlugan knew that that was a bad action. And from day one, he was bad then, he's bad now. The first thing we noticed when they came into office was that they were bumping up the budget for fees for private lawyers. Remember that? That was one of the first issues I raised with the Prime Minister and the Minister of Finance then. Why are you appropriating all of this money for the Attorney General? It was to investigate PNM corruption. Pick a whole set of lucky lawyers, call them his A team. They were on the front page of the news, they were the express, I remember. Go and look at it. Today, they're no longer A team, they are his M team. Millionaires, multi millionaires, paid by you, the taxpayers. So while you have been undergoing the recession and the depression, you have been paying millionaires out of the AG's office. And it went like this. $37 million in 2010. They bump it up to $60 million first, then to $80 million, and then they spent $108 million in that fiscal year. I raised that matter in the parliament not once, but repeatedly. I told the Minister of Finance, it would be a hell of a thing if you are appropriating this money to the Attorney General to go and fight corruption, and that money itself become the subject and catalyst for corruption. So what? Next year, another 100 million. The following year, another 100 million. The next year, another 100 million. And this year, another 100 million. So this government, under Mr. Kabla Pasad Bisesa, their number one priority was to give Anand Ram Logan money to hire lawyers. Half a billion dollars in the five-year period. And they will tell you it was to fight corruption. And if you ask them, what have you fought so far? They will tell you Malcolm Jones. Malcolm Jones and Gas to Liquid Project. And they would lie to you until they get back money from Gas to Liquid Project. The truth is, before they came into office, Petro Chin had already sued the Gas to Liquid people. Because there was a, it's a project that went bad and they were in court. They produced nothing. And to the extent that they got judgment on the case that was filed before they came into office, the gas to liquids people probably don't have any money to pay. So we settle for that. They will tell you E-Tech, Ken Julian at E-Tech. The E-Tech company is now telling the country, we don't know anything about that lawsuit, ask the Attorney General. Those of you who know the court and know the law, if the person who's supposed to have the local standard to file the lawsuit saying we don't know anything about it, then who authorized the Attorney General to file it? And there's something called champity, where you can't file no lawsuit for somebody who don't want to file no lawsuit. But that is hundreds of millions of dollars. So I asked a question in the Parliament, tell us how much money the Attorney General office spent up to December 2014. They wouldn't answer the question. The same way they wouldn't answer Mr. Humbert's question. And I stuck with it until the very end. They eventually provided an answer to the parliament. And the answer said that between the arrival in 2010 and December 2014, the Attorney General's office spent $343 million on private lawyers. A handful of private lawyers got that. Now, that answer would have come to the parliament from the Attorney General's office. They had 21 days to give us the answer from the books. Who have you paid? When did you pay them? How much you pay them? And the permanent secretary would have had the responsibility then of getting that information to give it to the minister, to give it to the parliament. 
They eventually answered in the parliament three months after the question was asked. And the shocking information shocked you, the people, and you started asking questions. All of a sudden, they're telling you the information that they gave to the parliament is not the correct information. It has errors. And the new attorney general, he gone back to the same permanent secretary to, to, so that the permanent secretary could check the permanent secretary's work and he will now have a report that he is studying to determine what the correct figure is. But the parliament of Trinidad and Tobago has already been informed that it is 343 million after they hide about a 30 or 40 million. Because if they can't show us where they spent and who they spent the 400 million on, another question arises, where is the money? You either have it in the ministry or you spent it. And since you want to lower the figure from 343 million, I want to ask you, what did you do with the money that the Minister of Finance gave you? Because the Ministry of Finance, every budget year, will present us with documents saying what the estimated money was and what the actual expenditure was. And we monitored that all the way, actual, actual, actual. So all of a sudden, as we speak now, the Attorney General is reading a report and he will come and tell you that there have been errors in the document and therefore the figure is lower than 343 million. And when he comes with that, I'm saying to him tonight, Mr. Attorney General, when you come with the lower figure, also come with the rest of the money that has not been accounted for. Because we now understand, we now understand that you cannot believe anything they tell the parliament. So you see, after this experience with this government, as we prepare to govern Trinidad and Tobago, one of the areas that we will make significant changes in is the whole question of the budgeting process. You would have seen us this year, after the budget was presented in the parliament, we spent a few days going over line by line of the budget, picking up excesses here, picking up shortfalls here, getting questions there, getting answers there, and so on. But at the end of that process, nothing changed. The budget was passed exactly as it came to the parliament with all the warts and with all the mistakes. Tonight, we're saying to the people of Trinidad and Tobago that the new government of Trinidad and Tobago will embark upon a longer budgeting process and the preparatory aspect, which is now confined to the Ministry of Finance, will have a role inside the Parliament. So what eventually will come to the Parliament will be a budget that has been worked on and massaged by the Parliament before it is voted upon. And will make the necessary changes to the laws to allow that to happen. So budgeting will become an exercise which engages the Ministry of Finance and the relevant other ministries long before it comes to the Parliament and the parliament will have a significant role by way of oversight committee. What that will do, it will prevent this nonsense of the coming rushing towards the end, bringing you some random numbers and ramming it through the parliament, and even when you show them where there are problems with it, nothing happens correctively. So to, 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 to front load the budget process with proper examination will allow you to take out what is bad put in what is good, and get a better budget statement and better numbers in the parliament. And also, the absence of the Central Statistical Office is unpardonable. You cannot run a country without data. If you run a country without data, you are at the mercy of the political liars and their friends. I can show you two statements by the Minister of Energy. One saying that for one quarter, the production of oil is 81,000 barrels a day. Another statement by the same minister in a different place saying it's 85,000 bar barrels per day. Same period, same minister, but two different numbers. 4,000 barrels of oil different. I'm not accusing him of taking any of it home. I'm simply saying 
He just has the latitude to just throw numbers at us. And so is the Minister of Finance, so is the Central Bank Governor, because they are now making up the numbers. We will have to have a central statistical office that stands independently, well-staffed, well-located, and staff that comes to work and issue documents on an ongoing basis. It's now almost two years that Mr. Embert and I have not seen CSO data on the major aspects of governance in this country. Empl employment, GDP, all of these things, not there available to you. So they are running the country by the seat of their pants, and you are having to take from them whatever they tell you. Now, understand something. We can do a whole lot better by simply making better choices. They're asking about policies and policies and policies, and they're asking the PNM, where is your policy? Well, Mr. Embert just outlined the policy here of mass transportation. You know what they will say? Oh, that's a Manning plan that Rowley bring it back. It ain't no Manning plan. It was the PNM solution to a national problem. And the problem has not been touched for five years. In fact, they did worse. They did worse. There was one minister of this government who said that the engineering drawings were in boxes under his desk and he was using it as footstool. While you in the traffic jam, while you sleeping on the road to go to work in the morning, while you can't get home, a minister of this government was using the engineering drawings as footstool. And they will tell you, it's racket rail because the PNM run racket. But they spend $343 million in lawyers and they can't point one finger at one PNM minister, one PNM person who was engaged in any racket. And they will tell you that it's a bad policy. But you know, when they got into office, very quietly and very secretly, when they thought they had made a deal, they invited proposals from contractors to build a rail system from Port of Spain to Arima. The same thing that they were condemning under the PNM, they tried to do it but they have not been able to make one iota of progress. Because when it was pointed out to them, what are you doing? Isn't this the same thing that you have criticized? They take shame and dump the project. In the meantime, the streets become more and more clogged. So up to now, in Trinidad and Tobago, they cannot tell you there's a policy in place, a program in place, or any attention to tell you, the traveler, which month, which year, this traffic problem will be solved. So the PNM makes that a centerpiece of our policy for 2015 going forward, that we will embark upon a solution to the traffic problem of Trinidad and Tobago with a mass transit system. And we're not going to go there and just pick up boxes and start working on them. We said before, and we say again, because of the controversial nature and the way they have dealt with this matter so far, one of the first things that the PNM government will do within one month of coming into office is to invite the IDB to come in and review what we have done so far and to pronounce upon it as to whether it is something that we should be doing. And once the IDB says yes, we will then ask the IDB to provide the funding for that program and we will build that piece of infrastructure in Trinidad and Tobago. There are airports around the world, airports, small airports with rail systems. But this independent sovereign country can't have a rail system to solve its problem. That is what they'll have us believe. But these are the people of no vision, of no commitment to Trinidad and Tobago, of no use to Trinidad and Tobago. They are only about themselves, their family, and their friends. What do we leave for our children and grandchildren? Those who went before us built the Red House. They built the highways. They built the Port of Spain General Hospital. Today we are spending far more money than they could have ever dreamed of and a government in office for five years and did not put down one piece of infrastructure to solve any problem here. And when they do, they lie about it. They're building a children's hospital seven miles down the road from the existing one. And then they pay Andy Johnson to go on the radio and tell you 
it is the first time in Trinidad and Tobago that a government has built a children's hospital. Andy Johnson has never heard about Mount Hope Children's Hospital named the Wendy Fitzwilliam Children's Hospital. I mean, they're lying in season, they're lying out of season, they're lying with reason, they're lying with no reason, they're just lying, lying, lying. You heard tonight Mr. Imbert talking about people with food cards. Now, if you create the environment for corruption, rest assured that you will get corruption. Because the corrupt will not give you a blight and say, take a pass. This government started out putting food cards in government ministers' car trunks and delivering food cards in the constituency office. Food card, like CPEP, like URP, were PNM social support um, projects, policy. When they were in the opposition, they hated URP, they hated CPEP, and they hate food cards. They call it the dependency syndrome. When they got into office, they fall in love with it to the point where they have to carry it home in their car and in their briefcase. Now, no government that properly runs this country would and should allow any minister to be handing out food card. Even the minister responsible for the food card system has no right handing out food card. The public servants whose job it is to determine who qualifies for a food card should be the only ones who should be dealing with food cards. And you should only get food cards on the basis that you qualify and you meet certain criteria. But Jack Warner will tell you, as he told the parliament, that for the Tobago House of Assembly election, they went with boatloads of food cards to Tobago to support their campaign team and gave away food cards like Sweetie in Tobago. That is not what food cards are for. Food cards are support for the needy who qualify by certain circumstances and the rest do not qualify. So tonight, they want to hear policy. Let me tell you what the policy is going to be coming in. We said before that we are going to give local government major and serious responsibility in discharging governmental activities. One of the major responsibilities that will go to the local government system is handling the social support system in Trinidad and Tobago. The local government authorities like Tobago and like Tunapuna Piaco and like Diego Martin, these corporations must have within them the requisite structure and staff, including audit for enforcement and all kinds of things that flow from that. And they will determine who within their boundaries qualify by way of the criteria set by the central government. And the allocation for supporting those persons will be made available to the local government body who will then direct those to the people involved. And then, it will have absolutely no opportunity for any minister to come into any corporation with any food card in his or her pocket to be distributed from his car or his constituency office. Civilized people don't operate like that. It is a shame and disgrace in this country that the country's managers could be so base. You, you know, a couple of days ago, I wasn't believing what I was seeing, so I called a friend I said, look on page 14 of the Newsday and tell me if you're seeing what I'm seeing. And the person turned the page and said, isn't that Minister Lincoln Douglas? Former Minister Colin Partap, chairman of a corporation and about three or four councillors in a photo opportunity with some unfortunate person who the minister was giving a food card to. So here is this person falling on hard times, a woman, in, a woman eh? falling on hard times, and let's say, let's say she qualifies for a food card to get something to eat. She has to debase herself by standing up in front of a camera with two ministers and a corporation chairman and others so they could tell the whole country you're getting a food card. Government money, taxpayers' money that put there for people, they decide you can't get it unless you stand up there and embarrass yourself getting a food card. I say to you tonight, 
after the next election, if you see any minister handing out any food card, you call me and that is an ex-minister. And the local government will not only be handling social services. If we have proper responsibility allocated to local government, they will handle major maintenance work. They will handle more of the infrastructure. And they will be responsible for parks and recreational facilities. And we'll have a park system where we will have employment created to ensure that there are proper recreational areas within the corporation. Some of those corporations have the opportunity for serious reforestation so as to have flood abatement because you spend 50 or 100 million dollars on flood cleanup every year. If you spend 10 million dollars planting back the hillsides and keeping the drains clean, you won't have to be handling that flood cleanup year after year after year. And the money you spend on CPEP and URP, you can put them there to plant and to protect that forest until it grows and becomes what it can be. And some of it can be commercial. So the first thing we'll do to get that going is to build and operate through the forestry division a major nursery where you get the seedlings sorted, planted at the, at the nursery and then distributed to the various corporations as part of this program. And if each corporation as falls under this bracket plants 100 acres or 50 acres of land in this after 10 or 15 years, what do we have in the country? Serious, serious biodiversity and we may have lumber in some cases. Today we harvest in teak. Every year, they're fighting and scrambling over teeth in the government teak. How did that teak get there? Past PNM government planted those teak fields year after year after year. And today, we have a resource that we can continue harvesting. It's the best money ever spent by the people of Trinidad and Tobago. So why did we stop? Why can't we do it now? It calls for a return to what works. It calls for a commitment to Trinidad and Tobago. That commitment you get from this platform in this PNM 2015 and beyond. You know, I just told you a while ago about the Express, where the, 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 the National Gas Company has gone to court and is in the court trying to stop the Express from publishing what they know about what's going on in the NGC. That is in keeping with this government style. As opposition leader, it falls to me to do what the Express does. Sometimes the Express or other papers will hear from me, and sometimes I will hear from the media what is going on and so on. Because between the opposition and the media, that's where you'll hear what's going on in the country. But in my case as opposition leader, the job carries a duty to engage the government and to inform you. Having done so, I'm now in the court carried there by the, the Attorney General, Anand Ram Logan, former Attorney General, Anand Ram Logan, who started out suing me and when I raise the matter, is it proper for the Attorney General to sue the opposition leader who is raising as a matter of duty matters that make the government uncomfortable? He then said, I'm suing him in my private capacity. But it's the same lawyers that the government hiring in the $100 million program, eh? They're suing me, so the lawsuits are filed against Anand Ram Logan, with Anand Ram Logan against Keith Rowley. I'm saying to you tonight, I'm defending all those lawsuits. But I'm defending it, Anand Ram Logan versus the opposition leader. I am telling the court, I am here as opposition leader. Because if I wasn't the opposition leader, I may not have cared two hoots about what goes on here. But this is a matter of duty. And I'm brought here by the Attorney General. And the lawsuit is filed Anand Ram Logan versus Keith Rowley. So, I spoke about how he handled and mishandled the extradition matter. That is one lawsuit. 
That is the same matter which David West is now being pilloried for left, right, and center because he's a witness in the matter in the court to talk about what happened with the extradition of Ish and Steve and so on and so on and so on. That is one. I'm in the court because I talked and I warned about the legal fees that I just spoke about. That is another matter. Because I said he was feathering the nest of his friends. And he said to me publicly, who do you want me to give it to? My enemies? But he still sue me. I'm in court with that. I made an issue of the fact that the cabinet illegally appointed the head of the FIU. And I had to fight and threaten the Public Service Commission, telling the Public Service Commission that the law that we passed in the Parliament specifically spells out that the head of the FIU must be appointed by the Public Service Commission. Interestingly enough, the Public Service Commission then took the position that they will make an appointment if they are allowed to make one. The opposition then said publicly that if the Public Service Commission does not discharge its responsibility under the laws that we passed in the Parliament, that the opposition will take the Public Service Commission to court and have an order of mandamus issued against the Public Service Commission. At that stage, the Public Service Commission went and got senior council advice that confirmed that the opposition was right and it falls to the commission to make the appointment. It matters not that the Prime Minister vetoed the Public Service Commission and kept in place the cabinet illegal appointment. I spoke about that. I'm in the court on that too. I received documents that had within them the contents of those documents, a number of development that match known activity in Trinidad and Tobago. Activities in the media, activities in the judiciary and elsewhere. I took those to the court, I took those to the president after I looked and convinced myself that it warranted an investigation. I took it to the president and asked him to use the integrity commission's power to investigate this matter. After six months and nothing happened, I came to you, the people in the parliament, and told you this is what is going on. I am caught on that too. I came here on this very ground here in St. Augustine, and I read for you a letter written by a mid-level police officer called Persad. On that night, I didn't call his name. I simply said that Prime Minister Kamala Persad Bisesa once again demonstrating her bad judgment for which she is notorious for. She wrote or called Mr. Persad because Mr. Persad wrote in his letter or he was called by the Prime Minister and asked by the Prime Minister to tell her who was PNM in the SIE. And he wrote an epistle back to her identifying 20 of the best trained information gatherer in our security system, trained by you, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, and he told her in that letter that these are PNM people. And he told her to fire them. And she fired them. And today, the police are still blind. The police still don't know what's going on. Because the people who have been trained to gather information, to feed and to sort, she fired them. When I told that the night, I didn't call Mr. Persad's name. The next day, Persad come out and call his own name. And that letter went from Mr. Persad to the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. Didn't go through the Commissioner of Police, you know. Went to the Prime Minister. So we have a Prime Minister who left the office of Prime Minister, went down inside the police service, to get information from Mr. Persad as to who is PNM, even though the country's constitution says that you are allowed freedom of association. Violate the rights of these people, even if they were PNM. Damage the country's ability to fight crime. 
and maintain the cronism of the cabal that is destroying this country. You know what? He sent me pre-action protocol too. But when he got the response from Ramesh Maharaj, up to this day, I have not heard from Mr. Posad. Because I indicated to him publicly in point 14 that the first witness I intend to call is one Kamala Posad Bisesa. I have not heard from him since. And of course, I told you that the wastage that is taking place in this country, the rampant corruption authorized by the cabinet in this country, once you change that, that is a major change of policy. And you start with the right people. What we have in office now are people who have demonstrated no commitment to rooting out corruption, and the cabinet had become a facilitator of wrongdoing. So if the elections, that when, when, when they come, if the elections do nothing else other than put people in office who will not be a cabinet facilitating corruption, this country would have made progress. I told you, the same NGC that is in the court trying to prevent the Express from publishing information for your benefit, that that same batch of people came into Port of Spain and awarded a contract to WASA in an incestuous relationship with WASA head and NGC head being one and the same in different places, making the same decisions himself to himself. And they awarded a contract $400 million more than it could have been done for. $400 million more. I want the people of Trinidad and Tobago to reflect on that. Cleaning wastewater. Not even a major exercise. Cleaning wastewater to become industrial grade water. And they paid $400 million more than it could have been done for because the two contractors who qualified to do it in the first envelope for qualification, when they opened the second envelope on price, they gave it to the higher contractor, the one that built the Prime Minister's house. The one that built the Prime Minister's house. And when I asked in the Parliament, why did you do that? This was a matter involving the Minister of Water and the Minister of Energy under their portfolio. On the day that that matter came to the parliament for debate, none of those ministers were in the parliament. Ask the prime minister today, how could that have happened? How could there be a motion of this nature in the parliament where $400 million was being queried and the two ministers involved, you make sure that they were not in the parliament. And you put Anil Roberts to respond. And Anil Roberts played himself to the hilt. And he was being coached by the Prime Minister throughout his presentation. And when I said that the in-house estimate at Wasa was very close to the estimate provided by the lower contractor on behalf of the Prime Minister, Anil Roberts said that is not so. Because SIS got the contract because his bid included the pipeline, but the other contractors bid, but the estimate at WASA didn't include the pipeline. On the page of the document, and the Hansard in the parliament, the lie was patently clear. I took those documents to the President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, and I left it there. And to this day, I have heard nothing about it. And while I'm on that score, the pillaring of David West, where they are about to tarnish his character in the parliament. So that when he goes to the court, the lawyers could put to the court that David West is a man of questionable character, as deemed to be so by the parliament. That is them breaking down David West's testimony before he gets to the court, laying the groundwork for the lawyers to attack him in the court. And the person leading the charge is nobody other than the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. When I tell you about bad judgment, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. And when she fired David West, when she fired Griffith, she was so sorry she couldn't fire Rowley and David West. 
She tried to get the president of the republic to fire David West. I want to ask you all tonight. Have you heard about the powers we have and the ones we don't have? It's either the powers are there and the president refuses to use it. Or he doesn't have it. Or he doesn't have a case to fire David West. Here is the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago ranting and raving, telling the president to fire an official. And the president does absolutely nothing. In a normal country, the Prime Minister would have wiped that egg off her face, call the election, and get to hell out of office. But you see, they're dragging Trinidad and Tobago down to a level where if we're not careful, very soon, many of you will not recognize this country. You better pray that we find some more gas. You better pray that oil price rises a little bit to about $70 or thereabouts. Otherwise, the quality of life in this country after this government has gone will be something you didn't know before. All the progress that we have made, they have undermined. All of our expectations, they have destroyed. Their five years in office, have been nothing but torture and pain for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And now, after they have done that, after they have spent the five years in office and spent or authorized $400 billion of expenditure, and they come face to face with the population in a general election, they want to tell you that the issue in the general election is Keith Rowley, his son, Carlton Joseph, and Vasi Rowley. So let's talk about Rowley. And it's all about Rowley. Well, let me tell you all something. My job, before I came into politics, was in science at the university. In those days, UWI did not countenance false papers. And did not issue false papers to anybody. Had I stayed at the University of the West Indies, this would have been the fifth year of my retirement. I'm doing public service. And if you all want to put God out your thoughts and re-elect Kamala Prasad Bissessa to continue what they're doing and what they have done, and you want to retire me, thank you very much. I'm doing public service. I've made myself available to the PNM to lead the party. And from the day I did that, that was an application to serve as Prime Minister in Trinidad and Tobago. This party is a party run by a constitution. And we respect the provisions of that constitution. And as we apply those provisions to selecting our candidates, I notice persons that have no party, persons whose party has had no elections, persons who don't screen candidates, they are all perplexed about who gets in and who gets out in the PNM. My advice to all of them is to look at the PNM's constitution, look at the PNM's longevity. Look at the PNM's love for Trinidad and Tobago and for democracy and stay out of PNM business. On Wednesday, we'll have our last screening. I told you before, as I told the PNM, in convention, you will pick your leader one year in advance of the election. That has come to pass. You will pick your leader by a one man, one vote. That has come to pass. We will screen our candidates well in advance of the election. That has come to pass. We have been screening candidates since September. Wednesday is the last day. Not everybody will have it their way. Not everybody's expectation will be met. But we will select 41 candidates in which this country and this party can be proud. And where there is disappointment, I simply want to say to those who have not been making the cut. You are not disgraced because you offered yourself to Trinidad and Tobago and that is the first step in the walk of a patriot. 
And inside the parliament is not the only place that you can serve the party and the country. So all those who feel they can create disturbance in the PNM, keep trying. Keep trying. Until the election day is come. And when that day shall have come, and this great party would have offered itself and you, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, would have chosen the PNM to conduct the affairs of Trinidad and Tobago, we will all stand wherever we are and shout to the heights of Trinidad and Tobago, great is the PNM, great is the PNM, great is the PNM, and it shall prevail.